Hello, my name's Martha Mary Baker, and I have the pleasure of interviewing today a guest from Australia for the LaRouche Connection. With me today is Lance Endersby, and he's traveling and visiting in the United States, and we have many things to talk about. He has been an engineer with vast experience, and he's now actively retired and pursuing some basic science, and his specialty has been infrastructure. He's a member of the Order of Australia. He's emeritus professor and was also dean at Monash University in Melbourne. And he has uh, much experience beginning with act after the Second World War in building projects in Australia, especially these same Snowy Mountain projects. So it's a pleasure to have you, Lance. Thank you. And I want to say what I think we're going to talk about today could come <laughs> under three areas. Yes. First, the, uh, what you actually built, tunnels, mm. projects, underground facilities mm. for power and so forth in the last 50 years in Australia. Yes. Secondly, what you propose, though, for the future, that we haven't built enough, we have a deficit. Yes. And third, uh, and this is where I'd like to begin, though, with all your experience, literally, in the earth, tunnels and the rest, you have some very uh, burning views on misconceptions in earth sciences mm -hmm. and hydrology and chemistry and geochemistry. So I'd like to begin there first, if that's okay. Okay. So do you want to say, I know it concerns groundwater, do you want to begin with your experience in uh, Australia and the Great Artesian Basin or elsewhere? Oh, okay. Well, let's start with the Great Artesian Basin. The Great Artesian Basin is the largest artesian basin in the world. And uh, for the last hundred years or more, it has been believed that the water that is coming out of the earth is surface waters, which is travel to that spot from rainfall on some points farther away, a thousand kilometres away. And this idea of recharge of groundwater from surface rainfall is characteristic not only of this great artesian basin, but of all uh, major artesian basins in the world. Yeah, we have the Ogallala Basin. Uh, the the Ogallala Basin is an excellent example. And uh, basins like that are just not being recharged from surface rainfall at all. Yet the professions involved believe that to be the case. And so in the Ogallala Basin, for example, we had the simple mining. Yes, the level's gone way well, down. It, 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 they're just mining the groundwater. The same is happening now, not only in the Great Artesian Basin in Australia, but also right through the Middle East, all the Muslim countries, and all the way from Morocco to Algeria, Libya, Egypt, and then into Iraq and Iran. All of those countries are exploiting their available ground, groundwater. And the important thing to note is that that groundwater is not rechargeable from surface rainfall. So where does it come from? Well, it is water that is part of the original constitution of the earth. And it's the same as the water that uh, comes up with streams and volcanoes and gushes from the deep ocean bed. So we have water which is part of the original constitution of the earth. And people have had difficulty in grasping that. But in recent years, we've had a wonderful lot of information uh, coming to us from excavation in the United States with the, uh, all, all, all these wonderful space vehicles. And, and can I just recommend to everybody, and particularly the young people, everybody should look at it as something that is readily available on the internet, and that is the astronomy picture of the day, APOD, A-P-O-D. Go to APOD on the internet, have a look at the astronomy picture of the day. Every day there is a wonderful image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope and others, the Anglo Australian Observatory, the Subaru people in Japan. They are all producing these wonderful images of what's going on in outer space. The flood of information is so great that it defies interpretation. So you're saying this relates to the water Absolutely. in the universe or hydrogen or characteristics yes, that's right. as in Mars? We're suddenly as in Mars. Okay. Yes, well, you see, you just showed me that uh, thing, a piece of news. This news they, from uh, Mars. News yeah. from Mars that they've, they've had water flooding on Mars. <laughs> um, well, uh, all the work from Hubble and the others has shown us 
but the, the, uh, the universe has got lots of hydrogen, lots of hydrogen molecules, and it was these hydrogen molecules that were part of the original constitution of the Earth. And now that's easy to believe. And that also, uh, these hydrogen molecules include methane. So we now know uh, that uh, methane may have been part of the original constitution of the Earth. At the moment, there's a space probe going out to look at, well, I think it's the moon of Saturn, uh, which has a great concentration of uh, water and, and methane. And of course, if there's lots of methane on a moon of Saturn, uh, why do we always think that the only methane that's a problem on the Earth comes from biological sources? Yes, the theory is that there were plants in ancient times and then they were compressed and that formed oil. That's right. But you're saying... Uh, I'm, 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 I'm saying the methane was there before. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the uh, willingness of petroleum, uh, petroleum is, in effect, floating on water. There's a water drive underneath the, meth <laughs> the methane and the and the petroleum. Uh, in the case of methane, uh, we have uh, very uh, uh, dense uh, uh, like pollution of methane in water. You know, sometimes 150 times the volume on a comparative basis. Where is this measured? You mean you encounter it? It's uh, 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 we're, we're finding it now in the uh, probes into the uh, deep sediments in the ocean. They are finding uh, these high concentrations of methane okay. in the sediments in the ocean. And of course, they're, they're, as I indicate, they're part of the, uh, the composition of the Earth itself. When, uh, when a volcano uh, explodes... Yes, I think we have a view of one of them, Mount St. Helena or one of the others. That's right. Well, when a volcano explodes, it is really uh, the explosion of a water-rich mixture, if you like, uh, deeper than the 100 kilometers or so down, and the and the and the volcano should be seen as a spontaneous disintegration of uh, what is in effect water-rich rock, and the water is an intrinsic part of the uh, of the composition of these rocks. And an easy way to visualize this is to think about uh, a granite, for example, uh -huh. and if and a granite will contain uh, white uh, 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 crystals and, and uh, quartz, quartz. Yeah. and the white quartz, the whiteness is microscopic globules of water. That's so. Geochemistry, that's so. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, the quartz, white quartz, has got water in it. Mm -hmm. And that means that rocks like granite could have only formed in the presence of water. And so we have these uh, intensely concentrated hot silicious type solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the metal sulfides, some of the metal mines around the world, they can be seen as precipitation from uh, strong water uh, uh, hydrothermal solutions. So it's fluid transformations, and we get still see it in eruptions of volcanoes with the Absolutely. steam up above. And the, and, and the deep ocean vents. And they and these vents are now we can measure them with we oh, have we're, 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 we've got people uh, well they're sending vehicles down uh, uh, with cameras all over them and they 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 they're looking at the uh, water that is gushing out, uh -huh. out of the floor of the ocean and there are animals down there that are living in these sulphur rich acid waters mm -hmm. and and they're doing pretty well down they're there? doing pretty well. <laughs> And so this, this uh, uh, gives you an idea that there's not only water deep within the crust, but there, there could be biological life living on that water, mm -hmm. which is an interesting thing. This is where our friend Thomas Gold comes in. He's a, a uh, student of this or a... Well, Thomas Gold is a wonderful elderly uh, a British astronomer who is now at Cornell uh, University. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been saying for some time uh, that not only uh, does uh, methane occur naturally deep within the crust of the Earth, but there's also uh, water there. And he refers to what he calls a deep, hot biosphere. Okay. So he says not only is there water deep within the, in the Earth, but there, there is also uh, methane and there are organisms living on it. Oh. And, of course, he's saying that this, this uh, has a great importance to the origin and, and, and extent of petroleum water here as well.
not anything developing around the world. It does seem as if some of the resources of petroleum are living longer than people anticipated. And that suggests that there are sources of the petroleum uh, way, uh, away from the place where the wells were originally dug. Now, of course, uh, 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 Thomas Gold has uh, uh, run into a bit of strife with the uh, uh, petroleum community, and they don't necessarily sing his praises. Uh, uh, in fact, they do the opposite. Uh, but I, I suspect that uh, Thomas Gold had a very perceptive view of it. And, you, and uh, so the prevailing idea in the textbook, mm. when I study geology, is you mean that it, you were to think that water crept down near the potential eruption site of a volcano and got hot and then came up. It's not that it was part of the no. deep earth. Is that all, all, all of the textbooks on volcanoes and, and also on the deep ocean vents all show a source of water from some other place percolating down, down and then coming Getting up. Getting heated up and then shooting uh, up. Uh, yeah, and so in the case of the normal vision of the volcanoes with all the steam that comes out of the top, over there somewhere, and there's a crack in the earth down which water circulates, it gets down into the rocks down here, it gets heated up by the rock, and up comes the steam. So you're saying, and Dr. Gold and other people and there are other yeah. scientists, that actually there's a deep composition and it's still in progress up oh. here. And let me ask you then, if that's the case, is the fact that we have oceans now, yes. is, what does this presuppose okay. about where this water came from? Well, um, uh, can we just go back on that yes. and get on okay. to the concept of the expanding Earth? Okay, all right. Uh, about 40 odd years ago, I was a young engineer in Tasmania and I was measuring rock surface uh, for an underground power station over there. I forgot to say you're a civil engineer, right? Yes. Training, okay. Oh, um, mainly involved in dams and big underground power stations and things, tunnels. And uh, we measured the surface in the rock, and I thought, hmm, this is you know, much higher than I thought it was. So I went to see uh, a professor of geology at the University of Tasmania, a man by the name of Samuel Warren Carey. And he looked at my data and said, yeah, well, it's in the right direction. The surface is in the right direction. And that seemed to be OK to me. And then he showed me some of the work he'd, he'd been doing on continental drift. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but his was a little bit different in that he was cutting out the continents on a sphere, and he was cutting them out at the edge of the continent itself. And he was trying to match them. And I match him, then if he put them on a blank globe, they match very well. Like indeed. a puzzle on a globe, it Just all like fits. A, yes, it all fitted. Okay. But, but there were great gaps. Uh, in other words, if, uh, where all the presentations are. So they fitted together in part, and the fit wasn't that good. And then he was working on a globe of about 80%. You mean smaller? Yeah, 20% smaller. 20% smaller, a globe, 20% smaller. So, so he had cut out the continents on a globe of the present okay. Earth size, like a model, and then he had another globe, 20% smaller, and lo and behold, all the continents uh, fitted together fairly nicely, and there wasn't any space for any ocean. So it was all, all landmass? It was all landmass. Okay. And so, uh, he formulated his concept of the expanding Earth. And I looked at it, and as far as I was concerned, it was obvious the Earth had been expanding. Well, it was obvious to me and Sam Carey, but it wasn't obvious to most other people in the world, because they asked the question, what caused the expansion? Yeah. And the fact was that Sam didn't know. <laughs> he just said, this is the evidence. Yeah. And the important thing, all the geology lined up on either side of the... Of well, you the mean it matched. The adjacent, oh, currently, that. Just like that. Yeah. currently distant land masses uh, match, oh, but indeed. they have the well, same... Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. So India, Antarctica, South mm -hmm. Africa. And, and it was all fitting to rather nicely. And so he came up with this concept of the expanding Earth. And of course, uh, he was ridiculed a bit. And as a result of his various proposals and, and others, in order to keep the con uh, concept of an Earth of the same size, the, uh, the idea of plate tectonics mm -hmm. was evolved whereby oh. things... Oh, they go underneath. <laughs> <and> <laughs> they go under the so the concept of plate tectonics 
that was in, in, essentially devised to be able to ex, ex, uh, explain this uh, phenomena uh, of the uh, movement of the continent on a constant Of course, time. excuse me, you do have major shifts in the Eurasian land mass around oh, India. Oh, oh, uh, That's okay, uh, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, well now, you haven't got to, uh, uh, to that stage. Uh, uh, Sam uh, found that he was uh, essentially uh, blocked because of this idea of plate tectonics. But you see, then another lot of information started to appear. We started to measure the age of the ocean floors. And over about the last 20 years, there's been a lot of wonderful work being done mm -hmm. on not only looking at the way the, we have the mid-ocean rift, where rock comes out and spreads laterally, and they've been able to measure the uh, direction of magnetism in it, and they have described and they've also have got uh, uh, measures of determining the age. And so not only does the, uh, the mid-ocean rift, does the rock come out and spread out just like that, they've also been able to measure the age of it. So, it's n so some are new, you're saying, oh, so yes. to speak. In oh, yes, well, well there, there are rocks there that are 5 million years old and 50, 60, 70, 80. And so the bulk of the uh, floor of the ocean We've got now measurements over a lot of it. Okay. And the oldest age is about 200, 250 million years. Fits in very nicely with Sam's view that was all together as one 200 odd million years ago. And so all of the data on the age of the ocean floors has enabled us to understand that the Earth has been progressively expanding. And so not only do we have a, uh, an expansion of the Earth, uh, we've got an expansion uh, of the oceans, the hydrosphere. Of the water sur of and, uh, on the surface, apparently. Right. And so the next question then is, how did all this expansion occur? And now, uh, intellectually, we're still locked into the concept that the Earth is of a, a constant diameter, and the atmosphere is a constant amount, and the hydrosphere is a constant amount. And this brings us now, if we can just digress onto Kyoto, <laughs> the, the, the famous uh, meeting and treaty again uh, uh, treaty about on, global, on the, uh, on, uh, global warming climate change and climate change and okay. global warming in Kyoto the various people involved were locked into the idea that the earth is a constant size and the atmosphere is a constant size and so all of the treaty was, was based on that yeah. now the actual fact of course is that the Earth is under continual bombardment from the sun, the solar wind, yes. and all the ions surfing towards yes. the Earth. And the idea of a constant Earth, and this is on which Kyoto is based, the idea of a constant Earth means that the incoming mass and energy from the sun is exactly balanced by the outgoing radiation of mass and energy by the Earth. And they're two huge sums. And it's absolutely ridiculous to say that they're equal. And I think it's fairly obvious that there, there is a net gain, and we don't know what it is. But there, I think it's obvious that there is a gain, and we have to work out now how it is occurring. Uh, uh, one of the things I've been uh, looking at and trying to puzzle about is the uh, what is lightning for example. And in the history in the tropics, we have lots of sheet lightning. Mm -hmm. sheet lightning the whole sky will flash. And uh, now how, does, how does, does that happen? Well, the incoming solar radiation is, uh, if you like, a positive and negative ion. And they're, they're widely dispersed. And so they can travel independently without discharging against one another. But as the solar wind comes to the Earth and it becomes concentrated by the Earth's gravity, these, solar, these positive and negative ions come together, and eventually there's a sufficient concentration of these positive and negative ions, they can have, a, if you like, a spontaneous discharge. So sheet lightning in, in the tropics, and you're seeing it all the time, <laughs> in the tropics, sheet lightning is the, if you like, the spontaneous uh, 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 creation of water from uh, from the solar wind. 
Yeah. And so it just helps us a bit. Well, you all know when there's a great lightning storm, <laughs> you get lots of water. And so this gives us a, 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 a hint as to the way the this, uh, increase in mass is occurring. And similarly, if you can sort of get down to Antarctica or somewhere like that and look at the sky, the, um, the incoming meteoroids, the, 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 the sky, skies alive with falling stars. <laughs> so you have empirical uh, proof that things are changing. Uh, you are witnessing change uh, 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 all the time. One, uh, so, so back to also your, uh, the, the idea of the geologic history, but that we're, we're living history now. Oh, absolutely. The, you also, and you had colleagues before you, decades earlier, but uh, look at look at the great Ortiz in the basin yes. and check out. Are the, does the oh, volcano yes. cavern? Does oh, the, yes. uh, we, well, we well, have well, some I, to prove the uh, evidence. Well, I'll have to go back to uh, uh, Gregory. <laughs> There's a famous <laughs> name. Famous in, uh, 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 British uh, geologist. A British British geologist, Scottish if you like. Okay. <laughs> yes. And and uh, he went down to London in about 1885 or something like that as a young man, and he studied at a mechanics institute. He got a job with the British Museum, and he did so well at the mechanics institute, they, the British Museum allowed him to go to the University of London. He did a Bachelor of Science, did extraordinarily well, first class honours. He stayed on for a couple of years and got a Doctor of Science. So well trained. Yes, and, and he was obviously a talented and capable geologist. And the British Museum sent him to uh, America to uh, have a look at the Rocky Mountains yeah. and Jesus in Wyoming and Yellowstone. so on. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then they, he was also involved in a, the first expedition across Spitsbergen. Mm -hmm. and, and around about 1895, they sent him down to Africa to have a look at the Great Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. So he had to collect some porters and rocky steps. And, and uh, in the, at that time, people were sort of trudging through those areas. They had to be fairly intrepid, you know. Uh, there weren't an awful lot of friends around. <laughs> and so he went to the Great Rift Valley and he saw these top lakes, water in the Great Rift Valley, and then here it was, high in the middle of Africa. And he immediately knew that the water in those lakes had never been surface rainfall. Okay. It was all water that was coming out of the crust of the earth. And uh, and he was pretty good. He, he uh, his book, by the way, on, on his visit to the Great Rift Valley, it is still in print. What's it called? The Great Rift Valley. The Great Rift Valley. Okay. The Great Rift Valley of Africa. He was first to use the term the Great Rift Valley, mm -hmm. and and one of the rifts in uh, in Kenya is still called the Gregory Rift. And so he uh, saw and understood this, and he could see that it was a zone of expansion in the Earth's crust, the Great Rift, of course and there were associated volcanoes nearby. And so it put together a picture for him, and it was really remarkably thoughtful at the time. And a few years later, in about 1900, uh, the University of Melbourne was seeking a professor of geology, and he applied for the job, and he was the only one that was interviewing. <laughs> he just automatically got the job, and he went to Melbourne, and on his first, if you like, summer vacation, which was in summer later, uh, he set off with a party of students to Central Australia, the dead heart of Australia, to look at the flowing wells. And the flowing wells meaning The wells? arteries and bores that yeah. were flowing. The wells that farmers had drilled down, and here's the water They're gushing out. Up. Gushing yeah. out. So you had to and he only had to smell the waters and smell the, uh, the so hydrogen the sulfide, sulfide and, yeah. and all the rest of it. And he says, these are not normal arteries and waters from uh, rainfall. These are waters from deep within the crust of the earth and they've always been there. Meaning associated with magma uh, or uh, some yes, uh, 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 he, Well, he knew, for example, that the, the whiteness in quartz, the shoot of water, mm -hmm. this water came from the same sort of sources. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's part of the original constitution of the earth. Now, of course, that concept that there were waters which was part of the original constitution of the earth was totally new at the time. Mm -hmm. And and the uh, people that were running the RTs and base and the you know, Queensland government, for example, they just couldn't possibly believe it. And they were saying, what's this uh, water? This is from uh, sources from the, the rain 
plane and surf from the right. Right. Well, it must be percolating down from New Guinea or <laughs> the Himalaya. Oh, you really? Know, yeah. Way underground. Oh, underground. yes, indeed. And and so uh, and, and they were totally convinced. And of course, they consulted some uh, uh, American uh, groundwater hydrologists who are sort of busily exploiting uh, some of the groundwater here. And the American groundwater said, uh, people said, all groundwater comes from surface water. That was enough for those guys because they didn't have to think anymore. That was 100 years ago. That was 100 okay. years ago. So Gregory stuck to his guns, but he didn't get anywhere. So he went back to England, became a professor of geology in, in Glasgow. But uh, uh, the, in, uh, in New South Wales and in Queensland, the government geologists, uh, in order to appease the politicians and to settle the argument with once and for all, they wrote these papers saying these waters came from surface rainfall. Okay. <laughs> now, and, and Gregory, a couple of few years later, wrote a rebuttal of that. Now, that was 100 years ago. Uh, about uh, three years ago or so, I was visiting Queensland talking about my railroad proposal, and the, I heard a presentation by the chairman of the Consultative Council of the Great Hope East American East Farmer. I said, mate, you've got it wrong. This is not the way it is at all. And uh, so I... He uh, said he needed more water, the wells... No, well, he said the wells... No, he didn't. All he said was that the wells are drying up and it depends on surface rainfall. Okay. This the is farmer. the way it goes. Okay. And I said, Count, that's, that's wrong. Uh, and then some amazing things happened. I, I, look, I, I wrote a small paper on it. Uh, I sent it to this particular chairman. He's a farmer, and so he took it down to Canberra to show it around. Well, the Queensland government hit the roof, saying that water is a state responsibility. And then the Queensland, and I said to my, uh, this chap that I was going to publish my paper in the Academy. And the Queensland government wrote to the Academy and said, don't publish that paper. It was very interesting. And then the Queensland government enacted legislation <laughs> proclaiming the areas where the water had to enter the ground. <laughs> Uh, where, where, where the surface water had to enter the ground uh, uh, to, uh, to flow into the, into the Great Hope Heathen Basin. And of course, all the farmers in the area... They called that, they said that's that off limits? No, yes. They, oh, okay. they, they proclaimed the area saying the farmers couldn't use the surface oh. water because that was an area... area. Yes, okay. that was an area of recharge. So the local farmers hit the roof and the argument is still going on. Okay, <laughs> so that's the question of science is an immediate question oh. of economy. <laughs> Well, one of the tragedies is that um, we've tended to m m move away from the capacity to speculate mm -hmm. and to think about issues. And we're always trying to make things black and white, which is never the case. And this means that we've got ourselves into the crazy situation where even in the universities, speculation is not on. And the idea that we can't speculate is reinforced by this mad system of peer review and all the rest of it. I think there's an awful lot of young people in the universities at the moment that are being held in a system of thought control because all speculation is out of court. Unless you can prove things absolutely, it, it's, it's not scientific. In fact, all the great scientific discoveries of the world began with speculation. And with the problems, as you say. And in fact, well, let's switch for a minute because we look forward to having you back after oh, I know you're working <laughs> actively on, on refuting the misconceptions of groundwater. I, I'm, uh, you're going to be looking at Middle Eastern yep. uh, data and so forth. But, but let's switch then for a okay. minute to another area of control where it said it's not economical to build great projects. Oh. We don't have the money to develop our resources. Uh. And you first. You were in on just the opposite. After the Second World War, you were building things. If you can tell us something about that, the Snowy Mountain Project, then uh, we'll come to what you proposed for today. Well, uh, uh, let's begin a little bit earlier in America. Okay. Uh, when Roosevelt came to, uh, to power, uh, and, and of course I'll go into his inaugural because I think it's fantastic, uh, he, Roosevelt got on with the job with CBA and, and Grand Coulee, and he had the Hoover Bureau of Reclamation Dam. already going well. And, uh, and Hoover Dam. And they were absolutely wonderful projects. And the important thing was that every one of them was big and changing. 
uh, Hoover Dam was by far the highest dam in the world. It was an arch dam. They had to develop new techniques of analysis to work out the stresses in the dam. Uh, the mere matter of the diversion of the Colorado River past the dam site yeah. was a fantastic operation. Yeah. And, and then, of course, uh, they had the largest turbo generators in the world, they had huge steel pipelines, and they had to develop new ways of uh, uh, welding these great pipes and so on. So there was a great deal of activity in Hoover, which was exciting and interesting. I think the challenge the Bureau and they lifted. The same thing was happening in the PDA. And, and the PDA was an absolutely incredible project because it covered so much uh, uh, countryside yeah. in Kentucky and Tennessee. Hundreds of thousands of people involved. And in the case of the Tennessee Valley Project, what was absolutely amazing is that all of the people in the valley, hundreds of thousands, were all captured by the idea. And they all worked together for a common purpose. And there was no sense anywhere of people doing their own thing or individual purposes. Everybody was united towards a common goal. It was an absolutely fabulous time. Now, uh, I was reading about these sort of things in the technical press, of course. I was watching it all right now. They had music evenings to give briefings on why <laughs> you should use electricity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it was all a wonderful time. Now, this was also being monitored around the world because everybody was interested in this, these fantastic steps forward that Roosevelt was making. And one of the places where that was noted was, of course, Australia. And, and we'd been thinking about the inland diversion of the Snowy River for some time. And so after the war, uh, we uh, started uh, uh, getting on developing plans for the uh, building of the Snowy Mountains project. But there are other people around the world also looking at all sorts of new plans for redevelopment. And uh, we started this project, the Act went through in 1949. And we then had an immediate problem because we really didn't have the strength in depth within our organization to get on with the job. We started off with a commissioner who was a hard-bitten old uh, hydroelectric construction engineer and he knew exactly what he was doing and he was a wonderful leader and a bunch of young engineers like myself. Well, tell us more now. How did the Snowy Mountain uh, training come about that you could go from one thing to another? Okay. Well, what happened was that we just had this two or three senior people with the background and a bunch of young engineers. And uh, one of the things that we did was that the Snowy organization entered into a contract with the United States government, whereby we paid, this was Australian money, no aid or anything like this, was, you know, we paid. We paid the Bureau of Reclamation in Denver, Colorado, to help us with the design of the uh, first major uh, tunnels and the first major dam, or two dams, and, and in the process uh, help us by training some of the young engineers. And so in, uh, in 1952, uh, I was sent to Denver, Colorado, and I, I was told by the Snowy that I had to learn to be an expert in uh, uh, tunnels and underground construction. In how long? Oh, I, I, as quick as possible. Okay. <laughs> and so I was sent to Denver, and, and the Bureau engineers, they set us down, and I sat down with an empty drawing board, and I started to draw up the first tunnel, a 14 mile uh, long, you can be seen at the Virgin Tunnel. And so I, I did that, and I was bearing away there for, uh, for 12 months. And it was wonderful working with the Bureau engineers, because they were all 20 and 30 years older than me. And they had all this experience. Yeah, right? and they just sort of saunter up to my desk and say, why don't you think about this or have a go at that? And, and every now and again they'd disappear and they'd come back with a book or a specification with a few things ma uh, marked in it for me. And there was this wonderful relationship between these uh, older Bureau of Reclamation engineers and a team of 12 young Australians. And of course, you can imagine being Australian, there's lots of banter, and, and everybody had a good time. Uh, but there was a, a wonderful human relationship there. And after 12 months, I was going back to, uh, uh, to Australia with a bundle of drawings and special papers. So I was hoping I could uh, answer all the questions <laughs> when I got home on the detail. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, yes. And so we then got on with calling tenders and getting on with the construction of the project. 
And then there's another nice development. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation had a number of older engineers in the late 60s, 70s, who had been construction engineers on, uh, resident engineers on Glen Canyon or mm -hmm. Grand Tule, you name it. Some of them in the Colorado Big Thompson. And they had these construction engineers who'd been there and done it. And so we arranged for them to come and, and stay with us for a period of 12 months or so. And they sat down with us and they helped us uh, with the administration, these very large contracts, you know, these were you know, multi-million dollar contracts, uh, quite huge things in those days. And once again, the relationships were rather wonderful. Because we'd get into a problem with a contract and we worry about this and that. And they'd say, well, this is the way we did it at Palisades. <laughs> <laughs> and off they'd go and I'd come back with some data for us. And of course, there was absolutely wonderful relations. And by then, some of us were a bit older, uh, we had children, and they were sort of, they were part of the grandfather circuit of, of, of all the young Australian community. And the relationships were absolutely fantastic. And so, the project was built on time and within the estimate. And, and it was a great, complex project. And it was this sort of harmonious relationship uh, with the Bureau that uh, helped it along. So that the examples of this, which I know have been recently published um, and available in Australia in the periodical The Citizen, are very appropriate to the Franklin Delano Roosevelt approach today. Oh, because yes. they're directly a spin-off, thanks yes. to people like you. And then you built more uh, underground power facilities yes. and that kind of thing. Well, you see, when, when you start off with a rocket behind you, <laughs> which happened to me, uh, and this applied to most of the young Australians that were involved in this, because of the fact that they were expected to become experts, they were trained to be experts, within about eight years or so, we were operating at, at, at World Front. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, we were, had already been working on the design and construction of two large underground power stations. And at that time, the Bureau of Reclamation had not designed and built an underground power station. So that was a first? Yes. And so no, the Bureau of Reclamation, they were watching us. So these are underground turbine stations? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Large and underground built. power stations. Well, well, there are two in the, in the in the study scheme, and I worked on the first one of those. But by then, as we were completing this first large underground power station, I was then invited to go to Tasmania, where the Hydroelectric Commission in Tasmania were designing and building their first okay. underground power station. So I, 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 I went to Tasmania, and uh, once again, we, uh, we had a government instrumentality, a government utility, and we had an interesting charter uh, from the Tasmanian government as a government utility. Tasmania was a hydroelectric island. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the, in effect, the orders from the government were we were to generate the lowest cost hydropower in the world so that uh, we would attract industry from Tasmania. And so, in other words, as a government department, we were ordered by the, the government to operate at the frontiers of technology and design and construction to keep the prices as low as possible. And you can only do that by technical excellence. Yeah. And, and so we were encouraged again. Um, we were the first in the world to uh, uh, use hard rock tunneling machines, boring tunnels. And, and that was an interesting exercise in that um, uh, we wanted to drill these several miles of tunnels through hard rock and set, uh, hard sediment in sandstones and things like that. And we found that in America there was a, uh, a firm that had built a, a soft shale cutting machine. For shale, base. not coal? No, no, not okay. soft. This is at the Missouri River on one of the Missouri projects. Yes. And uh, one of the Missouri River projects. And this was a Corps of Engineers project. And, and they had used, a, a, for a fairly short distance, a, a soft shale cutting machine. But we saw that they had the, um, uh, the electric motor drive system, which we wanted. So we, wanted, we got in touch with this firm in Seattle. There's some problems there uh, with the firm. And in essence, the, the Hydroelectric Commission in Tasmania provided funds to refocus <laughs> this company in Seattle, so here's a government department doing this sort of thing, to help us um, 
design and build this hard rock tunneling machine, which we're against in Tasmania. And it worked. And it worked. We, we sent our plant engineers over there. They worked in Seattle with the firm in Seattle. And then uh, it came, they came back to Australia with this machine. We put it up to the face, and it worked like a charm. We realised we couldn't get the muck away quick enough. We were oh, doing so well. The whole uh, so, mm -hmm. so we had to put a whole, redesign the conveyor belt yeah. system and everything else to move the muck quickly. And we were breaking the world record. Well, let me ask you then about, this is the positive idea of building infrastructure, but we all know wherever we live, almost, that the last 20 years then, mm -hmm. things lagged. Yeah. There was a pause. And you are now saying that not just in power generation, yeah. but in railroads, you have a yeah. peculiarly yeah. dramatic situation in the railroad gauges in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. But can you switch then to tell us, in your expert opinion, if we were to start tomorrow to have that same spirit and technology commitment, what should we be doing there? Well, uh, the wonderful thing about Ruth Charles is that he identified uh, not only problems in America, it helped to inspire a similar approach around the world. And, and the, you only have to look at the situation in Africa, in South America, uh, parts of Asia and so on, there is a need for much new infrastructure. And the problem is that the world is divided in various ways. In, in, in Africa, uh, the sort of projects that should be built involve several countries. Uh, in, in the Middle East, the problems of groundwater are sort of heading toward warfare, almost. Um, and, and so it's really a matter of trying to overcome the political problems. If you can put the political structure together, the rest is easy. Well, one thing I know, you've developed maps mm. to show Australia, but in political, social terms, how it's part of a whole sure. four billion people, if you count <laughs> India and China and East Asia ah, sure. and Southeast Asia, so that it could be a positive yeah. location, w w not a strife location. We have to look at that market. Okay. You see, we're just 20 million people in, in, in Australia. And one of our problems today is that our Constitution, which to a certain extent was based on the U.S. Constitution, uh, preserved a sovereign power at state level. Okay, not federal, state. At state level. And so that means that the various states of Australia uh, agreed to the Constitution on the basis that they preserved sovereign power. And the federal government was only granted powers for defence and foreign affairs and, and trade and so on. That meant the states were responsible for water, electricity, and transport. And, transport too, uh -huh. and so that meant that the states, and for the last hundred years, have hung on to not only the separate port systems, yeah. but separate rail systems and of different gauges. Oh, no. And so the state, but you see, at the time of the Constitution, that was regarded as a plus. Oh, no. Because the separate gauges uh, leading to each port meant that the other states uh, wouldn't interfere. Oh, wouldn't compete for the hinterland no. traffic. And, 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 and if you like, this idea of uh, separate state sovereignty still remains. I was in the Northern Territory a few years ago, and, and uh, one of the local bureaucrats told me very proudly how the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, which is probably about 200,000 or less people, had recently be, uh, been in Beijing and had signed a memorandum of understanding with the Premier of China. Oh, a state. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, you know, what madness this is. <laughs> but okay, if you look at the situation from the Australian point of view, mm. uh, there's still enormous potential in the North and so on. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the market to our North, uh, Darwin, for example, uh, the distance from Darwin to Singapore it's the same distance as the length of the Mediterranean Sea. So we can be communicating with all of that part of Asia and entering into trade with Asia. Uh, if you uh, see the map and you see the distances between Singapore and Japan, mm -hmm. at any one time, half of the world's container ships are in the seas between Singapore and Japan. Half of the world's containers are there. So it's a huge area based on maritime trade. And that's easy to understand when you think of all the islands of the Indonesian archipelago. Yeah, merchandise, and the coast. food. Yeah, and a whole lot. So, so we are in a good position to trade with that area and also to be a source of food. So this would d d help define infrastructure oh, absolutely. Where the, to build up for it. Well, this, this is what I'm getting at, is that the, is that the four billion markets and their needs
drives infrastructure development in Australia because, in effect, we would be designing and building to sell Australian produce and our goods into that market. So that's how you see, tell us something about the railroad, new railroad patterns yes. or new irrigated farming patterns. Yes. We have a terrific climate in Australia. Oh, right? yes. Well, you see, I've been uh, uh, working on a new railroad system that goes up through the middle of the Murray-Darling Basin, a major irrigation area. Mm -hmm. Where and it isn't now, you mean? Well, it is. It's a great irrigation area at the I moment. Mean, but, but, um, but the railroad is that? The no. railroad is new. Okay. Uh, the Murray-Darling Basin, um, it has the, we, can, we can double or triple the output yeah. uh, by getting a better access to market. Okay. See, in Australia, we have this, uh, what they call a tyranny of distance. And, and, and uh, economic development depends on access to market. If you change the access to market, you improve the value of crops, you change the sort of crops you grow, mm -hmm. changes the value of water. So if we have if you like, rapid transport systems that connect Australian farms effectively to Asian markets, it changes what we grow, it changes the value of land, it changes the, uh, the everything. And so I've been looking at transport projects to bring Australian produce to these markets. Now, if we can do that successfully, but we could easily support another 20 million people and in Australia. Right, and, and also, besides the rail then, you're yeah. thinking of inter-islands and uh, rapid marine yes. travel. How, yes. Have you been involved in that? Well, uh, down in Tasmania, uh, they've been designing these twin hull catamarans. Oh, yeah. And uh, these are fairly rapid. In fact, the a twin hull catamaran made in Hobart holds the speed record across the Atlantic. Oh, really? How fast? Three Average speed of about 45 knots, I think. Okay. Something Thanks. like that. You know, it's pretty quick. <laughs> a couple of days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of my uh, guys, a student in the faculty with an eye, was then. Uh, he, he, he did some wonderful work with them, and of course, uh, with the builders of this thing. You can imagine with a twin hull catamaran, it, 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 it's a devilish problem if you're running into a cross sea. Straight uh, ahead. You mean. Yeah, or you're going like this, you see. You, you, uh, one hull will hit the wave before the other hull. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bit of this sort of thing. And so this young student, well, not a student, he's 40 odd. <laughs> He is not a high graduate student. And he um, uh, was able to devise a sensing mechanism in a computer program so that the flaps at the end, at the stern of the catamaran, would go up and down like this. And so he had a sensing device to monitor the sea state, determine which hull was going to hit the water at which time, and the whole thing was adjusted, and it just as steady as can be. Oh, terrific. And now he used that on the Atlantic crossing. Now, uh, uh, these fast catamarans, they're, they're very good, and, and this chap's got designs for them with, you know, 500, 1,000 containers, mm. which are good for, if you like, inter-island uh, travel, which you'd have right there, Indonesia there or at yeah. that archipelago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bit, of, bit of fun. So the technology <laughs> is there. The oh, it's is the will. Uh, you see, with a lot of these things, um, every one of them requires a leapfrog and Thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been talking at this meeting over the last few days about the uh, railroad uh, which could go from China all the way through Kiev into the heart of Europe. And you'd have Russia and China all connected up as one common market, a fantastic rail project which could go ahead. And, uh, and the question is, where's all the money going to come from and everything else? And, and the fact is that the money is in many cases, relatively easily found. Well, in North America, you may have something to say about the idea that that railroad should go through Russia, I mean, from Kiev mm -hmm. eastward through China under the Bering Strait and into the Yukon and Canada. Is that, do you have a tunneling expert's opinion? Oh, well, uh, the, the, there are various technologies which are available uh, these days, and you have to look at the, at the cost of it. Um, with a tunnel like that, um, you'd, you'd want to stay away from uh, problems in the rock underneath, and you'd want to stay away from a, if you like, a floating bridge or bridge tunnel arrangement. 
But it is possible to have a tunnel made of pontoon, constructed in the dry, and then taken out to the site, and in effect floating, uh, oh. submerged, uh, if you like, you know, on the on the sea uh, 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 above the seabed, they could be floating, on the submerged, uh, anchored to the seabed, uh, and so you could have a floating tunnel anchored to the seabed, and and just join it up. So you're independent of the rock conditions underneath, and you're independent of the sea state, and it's just a matter of uh, uh, paying for the box and, and screwing it to the floor. And make sure there's no holes, actually. Make sure there's... Well, you see, that's easy fix. And, and uh, well, you use longitudinal pre-stretching all sorts of things to make sure right. it would work very nice. Is one of those in place uh, in no, a significant no, way? No, I, not that I know of. They may be, but it's the sort of thing that... And the bearing stage is a sort of place where that sort of thing could be done. This could be the challenge oh, that, these, that the projects of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt were yes. in, in the 1930s. He had the courage to have a go at it. And, you know, one other, do you, you said that after you retired, you're a civil engineer, actively retired, you're now in your most exciting thinking period in your life to try and work on, and so your priority is on uh, well, setting straight the groundwater <laughs> misconceptions no, of Earth history? Oh, well, primarily in national development. Okay. Um, you see, when you're practicing, and uh, as I was working for the government or, or when I was at the university, uh, you are largely constrained by the system telling you what to do. Now, if you're an employee, you have to do what the boss says. If you're in the government, you have to do what the government says. Uh, when you're in a university, and particularly these days with privatization and all sorts of things, you're totally dependent on, on what money people will give you for research. So your research is totally determined outside, and the idea of free scholarship is totally lost. So since I retired, I've been a free scholar. For the first time in my life, I've been totally free, and I can think what I like, do what I like, travel where I want, and I'm not worried about the money to do it. But, but the important thing is that when you are free as all that, all of a sudden, a great world of opportunity opens up, and there's so much to be done. And, and there are so many blockages. Governments all around the world, probably. Well, one thing is, is you, you're you making available the uh, levers and handles to reconceptualize, mm. to push ahead. Mm. You mentioned Professor Gold, Professor yeah. Gregory, Professor Carey, these mm. other people. Yes. Do you think among hydrologists and geochemists, uh, but, but otherwise you can force things through in the near future? What's your view? I am hoping uh, that there are young people out there. Okay. I'm hoping that there are young ones that see these opportunities and grab them and run with them. And, and the more courage they have to think for themselves and work things out, the better. One of the things that worries me is that um, our entire generation of young people are being conditioned and they've lost this capacity to think independently. I could go on and mention my concern about American teenagers. You mean that their market composed instead of mentally composed? Uh, the problem here is that there's a whole uh, advertising and other industries preying on the American teenager because the American teenager has got money to spend. And, and the money that American teenagers spend every year uh, themselves is about $100 billion. The money that their parents spend on their behalf is another $50 billion. So the American teenage market is worth $150 billion every year. You could build an awful lot of things for $150 billion a year. You know, from my point of view, $150 billion on spiky hairdos and, and, and bare midriffs uh, is, 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 is a total waste of money. Yeah, whereas if we put it, you mean, in building projects, since you were right. young and that's how you got sure. your... I mean, and, but so you, you see, could create natural resources. Absolutely. But you see, the system is actually preying on these young people and limiting their ability to think for themselves. They are being driven so that, in effect, they worship the corporate sponsor. And they don't listen to their parents or their teachers. And it means that they're just losing the capacity to work together. You see, all the sports they're encouraged to do, all the things they do, the skateboards, you name it, uh, there's not too much group activity anymore. There are not too many orchestras and choirs and bands and things like that. There's not too many group sports for young people. 
Well, I'll tell you, since the financial system that's been crazy that allowed that is breaking down, I think it's now's our opportunity, now Absolutely. or never, as they say. And I'm so glad you were here today, right. uh, Professor Lance Endersby, and we look forward to having you back to report on your progress. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.